Museum of Natural History. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the event this morning, a conversation on braiding sweetgrass with professors Clint Carroll and Natalie Avalos. Thanks to Zoom, we're welcoming people from many different places. But the place I'm speaking to you from is Boulder, Colorado. Our university sits upon land within the territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. And 48 contemporary tribal nations are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. For those of us who work here, especially non-Native people like myself, we have a responsibility to know the history of broken treaties and massacres in this place and highlight Native scholarship and ways of knowing that provide us with different ways of seeing this place and the world around us, like today's event. Two organizations on campus sponsored this event, the CU Museum of Natural History and the Center for Native American and Indigenous Studies. Our museum houses items from many of these Native nations connected to Colorado. We acknowledge the colonial pathways that brought those items into our care and we are proactive in repatriation and collaboration as we strive to make our museum welcoming and accountable to Native communities. The Center began in 2015 to create for Native faculty, staff, and students an intellectual and social home on campus. I'm honored to introduce to you our speakers today who will first have a conversation inspired by Dr. Robin Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. And then I'll moderate a Q&A towards the end of the hour. So you're welcome to ask questions via the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Dr. Natalie Avalos is a core faculty member of the Center for Native American and Indigenous Studies, or CNAS, and an assistant professor of ethnic studies. She received her PhD in religious studies from the University of California at Santa Barbara with a special focus on Native American and indigenous religious traditions and Tibetan Buddhism. Dr. Avalos is a Chicana of Apache descent and she's currently working on a manuscript titled The Metaphysics of Decoloniality, Transnational Indigeneities and Religious Refusal. This argues that the reassertion of land-based logics among Native and Tibetan peoples not only decenters settler colonial claims to legitimate knowledge, but also articulates forms of sovereignty rooted in interdependent relations of power among all persons, human and other than human. Dr. Clint Carroll is an executive board member of the Center for Native American and Indigenous Studies and an associate professor of ethnic studies. He received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in environmental science, policy and management. Dr. Carroll is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and works closely with Cherokee people in Oklahoma on issues of land conservation and the perpetuation of land-based knowledge and ways of life. He's the author of Roots of Renewal, Ethnobotany and Cherokee Environmental Governments, which is about how tribal natural resource managers navigate the structural conditions of settler colonialism and how recent efforts in cultural revitalization are informing such practices through traditional forms of decision-making and local environmental knowledge. So it is my pleasure to welcome both of these wonderful speakers and I now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jen, for this introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen. So one of the themes that I'm gonna draw on today is thinking about how Kimmerer explores this sense of deep listening, deep listening with the land and developing in her exploration of plants, developing relationships with plants, how part of that regeneration and development is listening. One of the factors there is really observing, but also just developing a sense, uh, an ear, if you will, for plants and the natural world, right? the land. So just to start off, something that we should understand about indigenous peoples is that they are essentially characterized by settler colonialism. 
right? So if we understand them as living descendants of pre-invasion inhabitants of lands now dominated by others, they're essentially in a, a political situation where they're contending with land dispossession, right? So they are essentially demarcated. Their lives are demarcated by land loss and uh, settler colonialism. And why do we want to think about settler colonialism? Well, we have to understand that settler colonialism is not just um, a political and economic relation. It's an ideology, right? So it operates by eliminating indigenous peoples in order to monopolize their resources and produce capital. Uh, and it essentially works through laws, racist ideologies, and structures of dispossession, uh, ethnocide, genocide, but also through a naturalized conception of land as an object for the human taking. Right? So this conceptualization, this worldview, if you will, sits in opposition to uh, what I think of as indigenous worldviews, right? uh, philosophical religious frameworks for life and living. So I'm bringing this quote to you. This is from Vine Deloria Jr. He's a Lakota scholar. Uh, he was trained as a lawyer, a theologian. He wrote um, quite a bit on native uh, law, sovereignty, uh, federal relation, as well as religious life, philosophical life. And what I find fascinating about his thinking, and I'm putting it in conversation with Kimmerer here, is that he saw a fundamental philosophical difference in Western worldviews and native worldviews. And something he says here, uh, the most devastating feature of the West, Western worldview, the idea, this destructive notion already forming by the time Columbus arrived, that Europeans possessed the capital T truth. And it was their job to make sure all people they met on the planet were shown this truth. This confidence initially buttressed by the domination of the, ch of the church that Western civilization represented the highest development of humankind was central to the Western worldview. And this is important because again, if we understand settler colonialism to not just be about a political relation or an economic system, but really an ideology and a worldview, it's driven by this assumption, right? This assumption that the Western world knows best it already represents the highest expression of development. And so it must then enact that development in the world. And that produces what I think of as settler ecologies, okay? Overdevelopment, destruction of lands, the deep objectification of lands to the point in which lands are harmed. Okay. So, why is it significant then to think about um, indigenous religious traditions or worldviews? Well, because they offer us other perspectives. And I think this is what was so profound when Braiding uh, Sweetgrass came out that lots of folks outside of native and, and indigenous studies were enabled to think about um, in a very deep way what these views do for people, why they're uh, relevant, important for us to think about and how they're still operating in many ways, right? And so if we think about indigenous religious worlds, they're existing globally. They're not a single tradition. They're specific to peoples. They're specific to places. They're often demarcated um, and characterized by places but also fundamentally by a sacred interdependent relationship to land. So you have this relationship to land that is coextensive, lateral, okay? The Christian cosmology that drove the development narrative is hierarchical. This cosmology is lateral. So what does that mean? Well, in a Native American context, right, the context of the Americas, we could say even more largely, what 
is often referred to is something called spirit or even the spirit world. It's this idea that there's energy or life force imminent in the world and it expresses itself in all beings in everything that is alive. But there are still some uh, persons in the world that we don't typically think of as having personhood, right? So maybe plant people, mountain people, water people, rivers, right? So in a Lakota context, this concept is articulated as wakantanka. So this essentially means the great mystery, that which is beyond human comprehension. Yet this dynamic world, this sentience, this life force, this consciousness intersects human life. It, it animates human life to some degree, yet it is beyond human capacity. So this should help us think about places as because they have this imminent expression of power is essentially sacred, right? That land has places in it that are more powerful and sacred than others because the expressions of life force, of spiritual power there are uh, more concentrated. Places are sacred for multiple reasons in a native context. It's the place where first instructions are often given. So origin stories, who are you in the world? Well, we're the people of these four mountains. We're the people of these rivers. We're the peoples of these waters. Well, then what is your directive? What is your purpose? Well, we do these things. We care for the land in this way. We have this set of ceremonies, okay? They orient you to your life purpose individually, but also collectively. They orient you to your responsibilities. What should I be doing in the world? What is my, my purpose here? There are also places of revelation, meaning native religious worlds are dynamic. You continue to communicate with the land, with the spiritual power imminent in the land. And you do this through ceremonial life. And again, this is where Kimmerer's concept of deep listening really comes in. Well, how do you listen? you have to develop a sense of a, a, an avenue of communication. And maybe there are certain people in your community, medicine people, those with special abilities that act as a kind of um, bridge between these worlds, okay? So this helps us understand indigenous stewardship. And what I love about Braiding sweetgrass is that she's not explicitly talking about stewardship as a kind of political project. Instead, she's helping us understand why a relationship with plants and the natural world just makes sense. Why it's logical, why it's rational, and the native logics that drive, right? So Indigenous stewardship is essentially the ethic that if you come into the world and the world provides you with everything that you need, the land provides you with food, shelter, but also ethical direction, philosophical, religious direction. You in turn are beholden to the land. There's a covenant made between peoples and lands. So you're beholden to care for the land. That is a unique duty to humans. Well, we have the particular capacity to organize ourselves in such a way where we can actively care and protect and cultivate lands in ways that actually allows lands to flourish and actually be well, right? We often don't think about um, the sentience and needs of land. And one of the reasons, one of the logics of ceremonial life is actually ministering and caring for land, for the needs of land. 
So that takes us to this concept that I like to think about as land-based ethics, right? So land-based ethics are ethics that allow us to live in relationship with land with this cosmology, this ontology in mind, meaning our sense of ourselves as coextensive with land. Because again, this spiritual power, this life force within land, it penetrates humans, it penetrates all other human life, gives us a common denominator, a common factor that we are essentially able to communicate and commune based on our sentience, consciousness, aliveness, life force. So again, this relationship is lateral. And it helps us understand that land itself has agency, it has personhood, it has needs. And in this way, land itself is also sovereign. And that sovereignty, you know, just to finesse that a little bit, we can think that the land itself is teaching humans how to live appropriately, right? This is also a ceremonial logic. Well, you adhere to and you are beholden to these religious structures because in the process of engaging in them, the praxis of them, they help you unfold in the world, understand who you are in the world, who you can be. You develop maturity. You develop your sense of self. You become fully human in the process. And again, one of the dimensions of this process is getting to know the plants and the animals and the spiritual nature, the characteristics. Deloria called it the personality. Kimmer described, again, the deep listening that is necessitated here. Coming to understand plants and their nature as not only persons, but also teachers. What are they teaching you about how to walk in the world, how to live in the world, how to be human, how to act ethically, how to develop maturity? So, I'll leave you with those thoughts and I'll turn it on over to Clint. Wow, what well do, Natalie? Thank you. Um hello everyone. Ukahatsi Kwani o Hadawadon. Um Galie Liga G J Do A Kohiga. Galie Lig G D Do A Kohiga. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy we're all here. And I want to uh, just thank um, uh, our organizers for putting this together, providing this platform for uh, Professor Avalos and I to, to have this conversation around um, braiding sweetgrass. Um, but also thank you, Natalie, for just doing a, a remarkable job of, of setting the stage for the conversation um, uh, from your work and your perspective on Indigenous stewardship. Um, I, had, I also have a few things to share. And um, what I would like to uh, do at this point uh, is talk a little bit about uh, the ongoing work uh, that I'm doing with a collective of elders, uh, knowledge keepers, and students um, back home in Oklahoma, uh, where I work. And uh, we are working on a land education program that is uh, very much inspired by uh, this book and by Robin Kimmerer's work and her imprint in the field and in, in the scientific community generally. Um, and so with that, let me take a moment to share my slides and I'll get right into it. Okay, so uh, the, the project Broadly speaking, uh, I've titled Knowing the Land. And um, this is a, uh, my presentation today is gonna focus on uh, really one half of it. Um, it's a, a, a National Science Foundation funded project, um, five years in, in, in scope. Um, and uh, the education component of this uh, award or of this, this funding mechanism 
um, uh, is, as I said, uh, focused on land education from an indigenous perspective, specifically a Cherokee perspective. And so before I, I get into the details, I just wanted to um, um, give a visual image to where I'm talking about, where we're doing this work. Uh, and this is a, a landscape uh, that you will find in eastern, northeastern Oklahoma uh, in the Cherokee Nation. And this is a uh, representation, uh, a kind of top, topographic representation of where I'm talking about with the uh, northeastern part of uh, what is called the state of Oklahoma as the Cherokee Reservation. And you'll see in uh, further east uh, of uh, the eastern part of that um, uh, reservation boundary, uh, the topography is very hilly. And so you see this represented in the landscape photo, um, um, in this orange um, oval kind of representing where I'm talking about. And as Natalie set up um, with a discussion of, you know, how, how do we define indigenous peoples? Um, one of the points that she mentioned was um, in relation to uh, settler uh, colonialism and uh, the impact of that being uh, one of the most significant impacts of that being relationship to land and um, um, that having been seen through uh, dispossession, so removal uh, for a lot of indigenous peoples from their homelands, uh, which the Cherokee nation, the Cherokee people are certainly one of those displaced peoples. Our homelands are in the southeastern uh, part of what is now called the United States. Uh, but he, uh, today, uh, the majority of Cherokee people reside on the reservation in northeastern Oklahoma. And we'll see here in this um, representation, this map showing the, the dark areas of the reservation boundary are the, the lands that the Cherokee Nation as a nation has been has managed to hold on to. Um, and uh, that's putting it uh, simplistically, but essentially as a result of the allotment policy in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, our nation went from owning uh, collectively or communally, all the lands that you see within this uh, this boundary, uh, so about 4.42 um, million acres uh, to uh, 100,000 acres. So that's uh, roughly 98% land loss um, from what was uh, promised to us at the end of the Trail of Tears. Um, and so we're working with this very limited land base, uh, which uh, with uh, within which to carry out our traditional land-based activities and knowledge. And so I'll talk about um, that in relation to um, uh, tribal conservation efforts uh, that coincide uh, with the land education program um, itself. And so I, I define this project as a community-based indigenous resurgence project. And its uh, formal title is the Cherokee Environmental Leadership Program. So I'm drawing uh, from Leanne Simpson, Anishinaabe scholar, um, Leanne Simpson, who uh, talks about this work as being uh, a resurgence, uh, a matter of indig indigenous resurgence. And so uh, I used to uh, talk about this in terms of revitalization, but I like the wording, the, the phrase that, um, that Leanne Simpson uses much better in terms of how it describes um, indigenous peoples, uh, the act of, 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 of collectively um, and, and, and from a community and a land-based perspective, resurging through the uh, reconnection with the land and with the knowledges that spring from the land itself. So as I said, this is uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. We also receive funding for the land education program from the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. Uh, it's a three-year program that began in the summer of 2018. And um, this is built upon the past work and ongoing relationships uh, with the Cherokee Medicine Keepers, who I'll talk about uh, in, in a minute. But um, basically, uh, ever since I started uh, working uh, with my community in Oklahoma, um, um, I've been developing relationships that have led to the formation of the Cherokee Nation Medicine Keepers, uh, with whom I've continued to work with on various projects, uh, but this is the most, this is the latest iteration of that and really fulfills one of their broad goals uh, to get uh, their knowledge um, to our Cherokee youth in ways that um, enable its, its continuance and also its flourishing among future generations. 
And this is an image of uh, some of the medicine keepers accepting a community leadership award at our Cherokee National Holiday in 2017. And uh, the guiding principles for this, uh, this program, this project, the land education project, um, were developed through a year of workshops with the medicine keepers uh, as far as how, you know, really answering the question, how do we as Cherokee people develop a quote unquote curriculum for an education program um, when so many of them had uh, received, um, had been, um, had experienced negative uh, experiences in uh, boarding schools. And so of coming from a Western educational model. And so some of the guiding principles that they developed through this uh, conversation, through the workshops that we had, one being a uh, building a strong relationship to the land. So one of our elders uh, said, we, we were always told as, as kids, you, you come from the land and everything you need comes from the land. It's your fault if you go hungry. Another principle is to teach by showing and therefore to learn by doing. And so in Cherokee, skwayoha gok is the word that's glossed in English as teach, but really what it means is show me. And so there's a profound difference between being instructed, uh, as Dr. Ablos was saying, from a kind of a hierarchical perspective, as opposed to a lateral perspective, something that honors everyone's uh, agency as individuals, but also as, um, um, is non-coercive in the way that um, uh, uh, Cherokees understand the act of teaching. Uh, also communalism and inter interdependence. So um, uh, uh, in Cherokee means if we work together, we'll get somewhere, we'll get something done. So this idea that we are interdependent uh, upon each other. And then lastly, having a good time. Um, so really stressing that uh, this should be fun, uh, this should uh, have a lot of pleasure and laughter involved, and uh, it, this reconnection should be a beautiful thing and should be um, something that the students enjoy doing as opposed to, again, being kind of a top-down uh, model of education. So this is an image of one of the curriculum development workshops. Uh, you'll notice that it's not in a boardroom surrounded by uh, four walls um, with fluorescent lights overhead. It's, uh, it's the elders surrounded or surrounding a fire. And that's a big element in um, our meetings and the settings in which we meet is that we always build a fire um, if we're going to discuss something of importance. So what we do, and I'll have to speed up here, so forgive me, but uh, I want to be sure we get to the conversation um, soon. But what we do, we have three group meetings per year centered on land and food-based activities. These are um, quite um, a, a, a lot, they entail a lot of planning. And also it's a matter of, of how often I can actually get back to Oklahoma. Of course, everything being stalled by the pandemic. Um, but ideally, we have three uh, group meetings per year that center on a specific activity uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, involves land or food-based um, knowledge and practices. The students in the meantime uh, work with their elders uh, and they are paired with mentors on uh, specific projects that focus and center the language, uh, but also uh, can entail everything, uh, anything about uh, the natural world that the students and, the elder, and their, their elder mentors um, come up with. Uh, and the, the idea behind this is that the students will present um, the results of their projects or, or the outcomes, if you will, um, at the end of the three-year program. Also in the meantime, I meet with the students. There are five students. We um, have a cohort of five Cherokee students who are all locally based in Oklahoma or the surrounding area. Uh, and so I meet with them. We meet together online and we've been doing uh, so since the beginning uh, to focus on the language uh, primarily. But we also do readings and talk about, uh, think, uh, reflect on the program itself uh, together. They also have outings with uh, tribal cultural biologists. And they also, during the growing season, they work in our heirloom crop and medicine gardens. Um, so getting that, again, hands-on um, uh, connection to this type of work and the significance that it brings. And lastly, they, they caretake uh, and maintain our tribal conservation tract with the, uh, the help of the Cherokee Nation Secretary of Natural Resources office staff. And this is an image of uh, a, a, a portion of that place. And the elders um, have called it, uh, it's, it's 
bureaucratic name is CMS 83, uh, which just denotes the, the tribal trust land tract that it, that it, that it is, uh, but the elders have renamed it uh, so the beautiful place of medicine. This is where we practice a lot of our activities. Um, so I'll just kind of skim through these photos uh, in the interest of time, but this is uh, an image uh, to the top left of the group uh, meeting uh, at the kickoff meeting in summer 2018 with Elder Crosland Smith, who is seated, and he is a practicing uh, healer, a traditional medicine person, uh, 91 years old as of last Friday. And so he started things off with a traditional blessing um, to make sure that everyone started off on the right foot uh, spiritually and that we we're all together. Um, so there are just some images here of some of our initial activities uh, during the kickoff meeting. Uh, this was our first activity in fall of 2018 that involved uh, the heirloom corn that our uh, Cherokee Nation staff had grown out and um, involved telling stories about this first food and then the students uh, ground it into cornmeal and cooked cornbread from scratch uh, with the instruction of the medicine keepers. And we had a big feast afterwards. So very much food-based uh, as well as our um, uh, another activity that we conducted that centered on the making of kanuchi, which is a food um, that is made from hickory nuts and you use these uh, tools to do so, the kanon and astosti to pound the hickory nuts. And uh, this is just our uh, activity uh, with Anna Six Killer in the center teaching the students how to crack the nuts, followed by um, uh, the students pounding the nuts in the kanon and then forming eventually a kanuchi ball, which is used to make a delicacy, a traditional dish that we have in the fall and winter. Uh, it's really an amazing taste and um, represents our connection to the natural world in so many ways. And so just to wrap up really quick, quickly and kind of springboard to a discussion between Dr. Avalos and I, um, you know, this, this project is absolutely inspired by braiding sweetgrass. I've uh, been teaching this book in my classes since it was released in 2013. Um, uh, but really to hit on some similar points that Natalie uh, hit on, uh, fundamentally views land as a teacher, as a healer and, and as home. Uh, we take seriously uh, the honorable harvest that uh, Kimmerer uh, uh, describes uh, to quote the book, when we rely deeply on other lives, there is urgency to protect them. We could talk a lot more about that concept too. Uh, our work is about restoring relationships. So the land may be changing, but as uh, Kimmerer writes, relationship endures. Uh, also bringing youth back to the land. And so with that, uh, oh, and, and lastly, uh, the understanding that with a healthy land uh, comes uh, healthy people. And so that the health of our communities, the health of our people is really connected to the health of the land. Okay, and so with that, I'll just go ahead and um, launch into our uh, conversation uh, about the book and how it um, relates to our work, how we've been inspired by it, really the significance of this, uh, this piece of work, which is um, so influential. And so... Um, so Glenn, <laughs> I have a question for you. I love that project just is so beautiful. And I, I love the pictures and, and just the dynamics that you describe. And, and I love, I wrote down the phrase, it's your fault if you go hungry, you know, because I was talking about human maturity and how part of the process of growing and developing in, in the world is figuring out how to care for yourself. And I'm interested, you know, if you could comment a little bit more of, about this phrase, it's your fault if you go hungry and, and just how that is operating in that context. Yeah, absolutely. So this came out of the uh, curriculum development workshop and, and one of our knowledge keepers, uh, Gary Van, um, uh, stated this as a, as a way of saying, listen, uh, this is what we were always told as children. Um, our, our parents, our grandparents gave us the knowledge. They, um, they imparted this knowledge of you know, what to find up there, when to find it, um, how to really how to survive. And so um, uh, in the context of the, the statement, it was um, you know, recalling childhood uh, excursions into the woods. Um, and you know, you, 
you didn't really pack a lunch. You just went out and um, um, and spent your your days um, uh, exploring and and being with relatives. And of course, that meaning uh, uh, not only human relatives but the non-human relatives that the land encompasses. And um, you know, uh, from his perspective, it's your fault if you go hungry. Um, uh, it really kind of extrapolates beyond the uh, sustenance of being out in the woods as a young person and um, uh, is extended to, to include uh, really just our understanding as Cherokee people and our connection to place and connection to the natural world that is there as, as Kimmer so eloquently describes throughout the entire book is there to take care of us. And so um, the idea that that knowledge has to be used, it has to be um, taken care of, uh, it, it, it encompasses stewardship ethics to ensure that uh, those plants and or animals are there in the future for your kids and grandkids to use, for future generations to use, um, is profound. Um, and so that's uh, kind of where it came out of and, and, and really the, the intent behind it was to um, instill in a cohort of students um, the same idea that um, the land is there. Um, it's your fault if you go hungry. Also, it's your fault if um, you are wanting for anything because the land ultimately provides. And again, that's that's not in the sense of property or of ownership or of claiming, um, but rather in terms of the honorable harvest, this, this obligation to a steward, to protect, uh, to ensure um, the, the, uh, the, that these um, gifts are sustained into the future. Um, so that's why it, it made it into their one of their core principles for the program is that it was it, it certainly you know in Cherokee it's um, it comes across as kind of a little bit rash uh, you know it's your fault if you go hungry um, but the the teaching and the meaning behind it is is much more profound. Well, I just love the directive because it just it brings you to attention right away and it reframes your whole sense of like well what is it that you can do. You know, because I think in some ways, you know, settler colonialism is, is a kind of worldview and ideology. It robs us of our ability to think of ourselves as even having that kind of agency, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, with thinking about um, agency and uh, what I've been thinking a lot about lately in relation to the book and what I think... I've been thinking about since I first read it, and it's just such a profound um, um, piece of literature to think with and to think with students, to think with other scholars. Um, and even when it was first published seven years ago, uh, was addressing these types of conversations that, that uh, inevitably come up in the classroom about, okay, what um, we've, we've, we're confronted on a daily basis with, with all of these, um, uh, doom and gloom scenarios and all of these threats to our um, health and our livelihoods and the earth itself. Um, you know, what, what do we do in this moment? And, uh, you know, as you were saying about uh, settler colonialism kind of taking away this agency, um, Robin Kimmerer writes about this in the same way regarding despair and these kind of despair narratives. Um, that are, of course, a rise in the face of, as you describe, you know, settler ecologies or, um, you know, extractive uh, economies and the, the results um, that spring from them. Um, and so the way that she addresses this is that, you know, despair robs us of our agency as well. And that it's one thing to grieve, um, but, but that's not enough. You know, what is, what is the, um, what follows from that grieving? What follows from that um, sense of, of sadness? Um, and, and, and according to Kimmerer, it, it has to be the restoration of relationships. Um, and so to, 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 to kind of connect that concept to, again, what drives um, the medicine keepers, what drives this program, what drives the students who are a part of it, um, really, even as indigenous peoples, we are uh, met with this moment of we need to, re we need to uh, perpetuate but also there, in, there is involved in that some restoration of these relationships, um, because as she writes as well, so much has been lost, so much has been taken. Um, you know, you mentioned this in regard to dispossession, also assimilation. Um, and so I think we're all in a position where we have a lot of restorative work to do uh, regarding those fundamental relationships, right? Yeah, so much relearning. 
And I think that's one of the pieces that, um, one of the most arresting images, the chapter where she talks about uh, rehabilitating the pond near her home and how she actually submerges herself in this murky water, which mortified me because that's to, to me one of the scariest things to do, <laughs> like go, go into murky water, I can't see the bottom. And I was like, what a profound uh, fearlessness, but also love and care and tenderness. And, and she talks about her experiences uh, uh, rooted in being a mother and the kind of, um, really she's exemplifying stewardship and these ethics and the, the ways in which the relationship with land had progressed to the point that she felt that she could do this and that she rehabilitated it over really years. It took multiple years. And that kind of commitment and care, you know, I had read this book in a, with a grad seminar last year and many folks, when we were talking about it, were just in tears. Just there's something, you know, you note, you noted in your presentation, experiential learning, interdependence, but also fun, joy, pleasure. And that was so profound in those images of just the deep relationship, going in and physically with your own body, tending to the land, caring for it like a mother mm -hmm. and allowing yourself to really feel the joy of the place as it re-enlivened, it reawakened, it became well once again. I think that was the, for me, such a profound takeaway. Absolutely. And it's funny because I was just rereading that chapter um, before we started this, this, uh, this call um, because I had also just kind of thought like, what was the one thing that stuck out to me the most? The one image and, and that's what my mind went to. There are many, uh, but that was the most uh, kind of um, impactful, at least in, in my takeaway from the book because of all the things that you mentioned. Um, and then um, you know, it was it was something that she had set out to do for her daughters, and yet the project kind of outlived uh, this period of this age um, uh, where she was hoping her daughters could have this area to swim, right? Um, but then it becomes more like you were saying uh, about caretaking, and so it was almost as if the 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 goal to provide this for her act her, her her human children became um, really ir irrelevant in the sense that she had um, connected to this place and 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 taking care of it uh, as as uh, as a mother does right and so this act of mothering to me was um, uh, extended beyond the human realm right like you were saying um, and then uh, you know we could tie this back to uh, the scholars who you were quoting before, you have Vine Deloria, Daniel Wildcat, who write a lot about knowing and doing and how uh, these things are interrelated when it comes to indigenous knowledges. Um, you have to, um, you, you learn relationally uh, in relationship to your instructor, whoever that may be. And of course that instructor can be more than human as well, right? And so we learn via, um, an instructor is a, is, a, is a poor choice of words as the Cherokee word for teach um, kind of displays that it's not really so much as an instruction as a, um, as a showing, as a, as a modeling um, and, and imparting of knowledge uh, in a non-coercive, uh, really trust, trustful way, um, a receptive way, at least from, uh, from the one who's doing the, the learning themselves. Um, and so those, those are kind of things that also stick out to me in terms of how this book um, continues to resonate over and again uh, in the way that I think about my work and the way that I um, um, think about um, uh, the, the courses I teach and the, the, the conversations that um, I have with my students. Um, yeah, yeah, no, the same for me. And, I, and you know, something that you mentioned there, the, the relationship is key. Deloria would say there's always a moral dimension to relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the learning through that avenue is so important because mm -hmm. you're held accountable, you're beholden. And that's is something that we 
lose track of. You know, it, I had this conversation with students yesterday about indigenous worldviews and how, um, because someone had asked actually, well, we're starting to address some of the Q&A <laughs> comments because I know we should transition to Q&A, but someone had asked about human maturity. And I just think about, well, that helps you develop kind of emotional maturity. And even just the, the whole framing of it's your fault if you go hungry, this kind of, this sense that like, you have to be, um, you have to use your agency and your sense and that you have to develop that deep listening because your life depends on it, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, thank you so much, Glenn. I just get so, your work is so uh, beautiful. I just love seeing the in process, right? Like how people are in, you know, they're doing this work in community and it's so inspiring and so, um it's nice to to see that yeah yeah and 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 likewise uh natalie you know the 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 way that you're exploring um these types of um movements and moments um that really are uh, uh, defining of our time um and and so important in terms of understanding what it is that uh, indigenous peoples and the ethical frameworks um that guide our communities um, have to offer the world and how this fundamentally upsets or unsettles um, the way that um, uh, we see things unfolding uh, even presently. Um, uh, and so that is, a, again, kind of a profound contribution um, that I see, um, you know, resonating with, uh, with Kimmerer's work with a lot of other uh, Indigenous, you know, thinkers and, and activists and, and, and community leadership um, is is that it's coming to a point where um, so much has been taken, so much has been lost, but we still have so much to offer uh, from our knowledge systems. And that in my work has been uh, an amazing kind of revolution, if you will, because when I first started out um, working with knowledge keepers, with elders, um, things were necessarily slow going because uh, to really kind of get a project like this moving, to get a group like the Cherokee Nation Medicine Keepers to, um, to really pick up speed or gain momentum uh, required that very careful, deliberate process of developing relationships. And, um, and the, the knowledge was not shared from the outset. It was, uh, and that's because of the that what has been taken, not only in terms of land and resources, but in terms of knowledge and, um, uh, and assimilation. Um, but once we established a relationship of trust among, uh, between them and myself, I didn't grow up uh, in, in Oklahoma, I didn't grow up in the Cherokee Nation. And so there were some barriers there um, for me as a, as a, uh, as a young uh, researcher, as a scholar, as a community-based researcher. Um, but the revolution that I speak of has been since that time, uh, and it's been uh, close to 20 years, um, I've seen a remarkable kind of transformation in the way that they are understanding their role and what they have to offer. Um, and really saying this knowledge, granted, you know, we, want it, we still wanna be careful with what we get out into the world because there are some sacred things, there are some things that may, um, uh, if, if used improperly, cause people to do harm upon themselves or others unintentionally. Um, but there are some concepts that we have to offer that the world needs to hear. And I think the, the book, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, I mean, we read the, uh, the blurb uh, on the cover, a, a hymn of love to the world, right? I think that's so beautifully put and that this is, uh, there is an urgency to this message and indigenous people are, are saying um, uh, we need to all uh, start taking seriously the ethical and moral frameworks that you uh, were highlighting um, uh, if, if we want to see things um, um, flourish into the future. Um, Kimura talks about these two paths, you know, the Anishinaabe or, or Potawatomi prophecy of the, the seventh fire, the eighth, and, 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 and really the, the the, the crossroads that we're met with, uh, the fork in the road. Can you, do you choose the scorched path or do you choose the green path? And that's really profound. And I think you look across indigenous um, uh, nations and you see similar prophecies um, throughout. Mm -hmm.
you know, for good reason, right? Because our lives depend on it <laughs> in yeah. this moment. Yeah. And, it, and I think you're right, though, that we're in a moment where these ideas, you know, because they've been percolating and they've been there the whole time, but it's, um, right. I think non-Native people are more attentive to them. Mm -hmm. and they're more invested because I think they are also independently coming to very similar conclusions and wanting to find mm -hmm. other frameworks. You know, Deloria talked a lot about how, um, well, having a deeply embodied and relational um, experience of the world is not unique to Native people. It's just that in a Western context, there's no intellectual framework to understand it. And so part of what books like Kimmerer's are doing, they're providing that intellectual framework. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's giving us all uh, an opportunity to deepen in, in um, our relationships with land, but also create a more nuanced understanding of the possibilities there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. That's a wonderful way of kind of looking at this is like, and the way that she's able to to bring in the, these very personal um, stories about the everyday and how there's more there's more to it than just it, you know a mundane kind of um, um, routine. Uh, she's finding the the profundity in these everyday actions and how they actually enact what she's trying to teach. Um, so absolutely, so well put. <laughs> Well, I know we have some questions in the Q&A, so Jen, uh, please direct us. Sure. Um, I am just getting us all here together. So um, basically, we have a great number of questions, uh, which we can't get to all of them, but there are a few that are circling around a, a similar question. And that really has to do with what the role of non-Native peoples might be once learning about this way of seeing. So one of the things I'm inspired about from Robert and Kimmerer is it makes me ask new questions of the, the places and the animals and plants around me. Um, and that when we think of a plant as a teacher, it fundamentally changes what our relationship is, right? We say, what can I, what can I learn from you? Which is a question that sets us up in a relationship in a way that maybe we wouldn't have asked before. And so I think what folks here are asking is basically, should non-Native people have a different relationship uh, with um, the world in this way or strive to have a similar one? Um, or put another way, um, how can or how should white descendants from colonial settlers, um, sorry, I have to uh, honor indigenous teachings um, and have these kinds of deliberate relationship building with indigenous wisdom keepers and also the world around us. So, you know, what, what should and shouldn't non-native people, um, you know, do with this way of seeing? What a great question. I feel like that's where we were actually going, Clint and I organically, you know, and I think of this as the possibilities of um, that, we're on the verge of a kind of paradigm shift, you know, in the sense that the deep materialism that had really characterized uh, empir empirical study and the, you know the scientific knowledge production are have been challenged quite a bit in this last you know several decades, uh, maybe since mid twentieth century, and how might we then broaden our empirical uh, methods. How might we understand that that which maybe we can't see or measure is also um, impacting us? And how is it that one of the, as someone trained in a, a religious studies context, I think about the divisions that have been made through the Enlightenment project of the moral, philosophical, philosophical ethical, and that which is um, you know, considered hard science data, you know, hard facts, knowledge, the, the knowledge that we produce in, in universities that has, I think, more value. And bridging those again, I think, is really what we need. And I think for non-Native people, it can be helpful to challenge the deep materialism, the ways in which we still objectify land, 
the ways in which we still objectify peoples, plants, animals, so on, and pushing back against these um, legacies that legacy, the legacy of materialism it, to me comes from a overcorrection around trying to seek autonomy from church directives, which had controlled knowledge production in the past. So how might we move back from that overcorrection and allow ourselves to develop a more robust intellectual framework for knowing and caring for the land and seeing our relationship as salient and important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I really resonate and uh, appreciate the way you put that, this idea of the kind of looking at broadly the path or the, the, the trajectory of, of Western history um, as, as and, and the scientific, um, the, the enlightenment um, as being an overcorrection from religious dogma. Um, well, with, you know, with, with, with the scientific, um, uh, this kind of sense of enlightenment uh, and, and, and rational thought, everything went out the window, including um, the types of uh, traditions that were at one point present in Europe and, and other places of the world um, that did have a land-centered way of, of looking at life, um, went out with the religious dogma, and now the sole focus was scientific rationality. Uh, so that overcorrection, as you say, is, is, is profound in that there was a lot lost in that process um, that, um, as you say, you know, over the, the, the past few decades has been, uh, folks have been kind of scratching their heads and wondering if this is the, the, the trajectory that we could, should continue to head in. And, you know, to get at the question um, again, you know, Robin Kimmer writes really eloquently and is also incredibly kind in the way that she views this question. Um, and she writes about it in terms of naturalization versus nativeness, okay? Um, that, that there shouldn't be a sense that non-native people um, should, should claim nativeness or, or a native positionality in relation to the land, uh, but rather kind of this naturalization um, and the responsibilities that come with it. Um, and so I, that's just kind of one way that she frames it that I think is really uh, well put. And you think, and you look at these movements, uh, indigenous led movements like Standing Rock, like um, more recently the Land Back um, uh, movement, if you will, um, uh, the hashtag, but it's kind of based, it's kind of coming out of these uh, movements, um, uh, what so and being one in British Columbia um, uh, and thinking about that in terms of this perspective, the, these, the stands that native people are taking to protect the land fundamentally are claims that it benefits everyone. So indigenous sovereignty benefits everyone. Land back benefits every, everyone when it, uh, regarding indigenous nations, right? And so going back to Natalie's presentation about indigenous stewardship, um, those are the, the kind of guiding or the, the, the foundational principles that uh, motivate these calls for land back. Um, they're not a, a, a reacquisition of ownership and control. They are an assertion to continue these relationship responsibilities that are founded in, in stewardship ethics, right? Thanks for that. Um, we have uh, some other questions and one I thought might be helpful for for us to think about since we are speaking today from a university. Um, and that question is, um, what is the role of institutions of higher Western education like CU Boulder in perpetuating or challenging um, destructive settler mindsets and relationships with land? And in your experiences at CU, what can CU do to confront this about itself? Mm. Well, I have lots of ideas about this. Clint, do, do you want to go first? Um, well, yeah, I have lots of ideas too. Um, I think, you know, it, there has been some movement um, uh, recently and that's been um, spurred by uh, the moment that we're finding ourselves in um, as a society uh, in, in the United States. Um, and, um, these are 
really important conversations um, with uh, entities like the Center for Native American Indigenous Studies, um, with other Indigenous um, uh, students, faculty, staff throughout the CU system about um, honoring and recognizing um, the contributions of Indigenous um, students, faculty, and staff, uh, as well as uh, honoring the land on which the university sits and, um, and being very explicit about um, the history that it has led up to the moment of, um, of possession and that a lot of uh, folks take for granted uh, in Colorado and beyond. Um, and then um, where do we go from there? What are the, um, the, the efforts that can, uh, or the, what are the, the ways that the institution can support the efforts that um, our indigenous community on campus is, is trying to make with regard to transforming the way we understand education. Um, um, you know, it's been um, a, a dream of mine to be able to, uh, you know, uh, do some activities that involve land-based education. Uh, um, but of course, those relationships need to be established and those resources um, have to be available to, to develop such courses that um, get students out of the classroom and onto the land in a way that enacts like Robin Kimmerer so eloquently shows in the book, these types of practices, what it looks like to, to, to get back into relationship. Um, there's a lot more I can say, but I'll, I'll pass it off to you, Natalie. So to me, um, this is a question of really making visible structural inequities and the legacy of uh, settler colonialism's impact on knowledge production, right? And how it served colonial aims historically, but how, um, how do we interrogate that legacy in every dimension of the academy, in every department, in every discipline, and understand the ways in which um, knowledge production is not neutral by any means, uh, think about and make salient these dynamics of power, the legacy of racism, the legacy of, of uh, silencing indigenous cultures and knowledges and in life ways, and really also thinking about how structural dispossession continues to operate. <laughs> so, you know, it, there is a, a question in the Q&A about the, it's your fault if you're hungry it, and it sounds untrue. And I think, yeah, you know, for those that are born into poverty and you don't have those options, how might we in the academy make structural asymmetrical relationships, right? <laughs> The fact that there are some people that are structurally dispossessed, continue to be structurally dispossessed, and why? Let's have a conversation. Can we be the place? If we can't do it in our larger society, have an honest conversation, then we should in the academy be able to have honest conversations about why there are those that continue to be structurally dispossessed and are prevented from having full agency, access to land, access to their livelihood, right? Why is that the case? And really, I think that's our, our should be our next step and our next collective goal is making those things so clear, so visible, having deep conversations among disciplines about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, now, I, I was thinking about asking you both about an image or a story that stuck with you from the book that you carry with you. And Natalie, I think we heard one of yours, which was getting stuck in a mucky pond. Um, but I'm wondering, Clint, if there's a lasting image or scene or story from the book that we can close out our discussion with today that has stayed with you ever since you've read Dr. Kimmerer's book. Sure, and I know we, we're, we're out of time, so I'll, I'll be brief, but I, I highly recommend folks to, to check this book out. And um, I think there's a, um, a relationship set up with the Boulder Bookstore to um, uh, purchase uh, uh, this a copy of this. Are you gonna take care of this? Okay, all right, you'll mention it, but um, check it out because uh, there's so much more I could say, but um, I'm really inspired by the chapter on the Superfund and the sacred in which she really expounds on this idea of restoring relationships when it comes to ecological restoration. And the image that she's able to paint 
um, in that chapter of, you know, looking specifically at Onondaga Lake, which has been inter uh, impacted detrimentally uh, beyond belief um, by uh, toxic um, uh, waste uh, from the Solvay uh, and, and many other uh, chemicals, uh, uh, in chemical industries. Um, and, and kind of painting this, this image of what this place, this sacred place to Onondaga people, the place that once um, uh, described uh, a place of peace, a place of healing, a place of identity, the tree of peace uh, stood near this lake uh, that so informs Onondaga and Haudenosaunee um, uh, law, governance, cosmology. Um, and uh, to look at that image that she paints uh, with regard to the hard work of restoring not only the, the ecology to create a, he a healthy environment, but what the relationships entail and people coming together uh, to be in this place, um, not only native people, but others uh, to join in this kind of um, sense of home, sense of place um, is, is an image that is profound to me and, and for, for the primary reason that it's hopeful. And I think that's what we need a lot more of today. Thanks so much, Clint. Well, I am just going to say thanks to all of you who have um, stayed with us for a few extra minutes. Um, and I just want to thank our speakers so much. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions. Um, but they were wonderful questions and thank you for being engaged with today's talk. Um, as Clint mentioned, you can purchase Braiding Sweetgrass online at the Boulder Bookstore. And if you mention CU Boulder in the comment or special instruction section, 10% of those proceeds will benefit Native, Native American students at CU Boulder. And mark your calendars if you want more discussion um, around braiding sweetgrass. Dr. Robin Kimmerer will actually be giving a talk live one week from today for CU Boulder on December 8th at 4 p.m. over Zoom and Dr. Carroll will be introducing her. So you can register and find more information about that event on the calendar page at the CU Museum of Natural History's website. Thanks so much, everybody. We we're so glad you could join us today. Thank you for choosing to spend your time on this conversation. And thank you, Natalie and Clint, for joining us. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, all. <laughs>